So um, we'll talk about whole body CT scanning trauma. And um, although I can tell you right off the bat that I don't have an answer for that question, if it's right or wrong, I have a bias because we don't do it. And because in 1996, we were the third group in the country to publish the lar one of the largest series on ultrasound. So we are ultrasound biased. We are ultrasound heavy. Um, and uh, we, we, we never embrace the concept of whole, whole body CT. But I'll try to be as fair as I can and show you the, date, the data. So there's, like for everything else, there's pros and cons. Uh, there is some evidence that's confusing, and uh, I'll show you what the evidence that's out there is. Um, and maybe what we need to discuss is what's the right way to approach this and, and try to incorporate this into an institutional algorithm that makes sense without harming patients. So this is the history. Uh, the truth of the matter is that since, since the 1980s, when the spiral CTs uh, were uh, brought to the market, uh, there has been a revolution in the way uh, we think about diagnostic modalities in trauma and in healthcare in general. Uh, with the multi-slice CT introduced in, in the 90s, uh, the concept of whole body CT became feasible because it's a faster test. You don't need to be in the scanner for an hour and a half like we used to in 1980. And uh, the images are much better quality. In the 2000s, there, uh, uh, we start seeing a number of trauma centers embracing the concept of whole body CT, uh, particularly done in the early res uh, phase of the resuscitation uh, of trauma patients. And then uh, later on, um, we start, you know, the pendulum goes back and people are starting to think about the consequences of all that radiation exposure that you heard uh, Todd and others uh, commenting on today. So if there are advantages, and there might be some advantages of doing whole body CT, we need to justify it uh, against the cost and the radiation exposure. And those discussions are very controversial, and people get very passionate about it. So what are the cons? Cost money more than other methods, more than ultrasound for sure. There's the issue of radiation exposure. Uh, getting the test, particularly with 64 slicer scanners and faster scanners, we just got in our ED two weeks ago a 312, I think, 300 and something slice scanner that you can go from head to toe in like 20 seconds. Well, that's great. Technology is there, but so you get the test very easily, very quickly. But the question is, it still needs to be read. You still have wet readings, final readings, and you're going to find uh, a number of injuries that really we were not aware 10 or 15 years ago, and we don't know what to do for them. And there is always this question whether or not making those diagnoses is clinically relevant and changes outcomes. I can tell you one thing, I've never seen so many adrenal hematomas in my life like I've seen the last five years. <laughs> you know, I, I've been doing this for 24 years. I had no idea that they existed 20 years ago. I knew they existed maybe 10 years ago. I didn't know what to do with them. Today, I know they really exist and I still don't know what to do with them. So you're gonna pick up on a bunch of things that may not be clinically relevant, maybe not uh, uh, relevant to, to patient care and outcomes. What are the positive aspects? You get it quickly, so uh, you don't need to be in the scanner for a prolonged period of time. The images are so good that you see a lot. So the accuracy has improved. Uh, some folks believe that the effectiveness of whole body CT has been demonstrated. I'll show you some data. And uh, some people try to push the envelope and even conclude that there is a change in outcome, particularly in mortality, and I'll show you how the data is conflicting. This is one of the first studies uh, done at uh, USC by Ali Salim and Dimitri and others, and they questioned does early bo whole body CT in trauma patients result in changes in management. They were not looking at really at patient outcomes. 
but this was published in archives in 2006, uh, done at a time that uh, they were still in the old hospital with an old scanner, uh, but uh, nonetheless, spiral CT. And basically, the intervention was pan scan at the time, head, C-spine, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, in patients that had no visible signs of injury to the chest or abdomen, they were hemodynamically stable, had a normal abdominal examination, uh, neurologically they were intact, so people that really didn't have anything that made you suspect of a significant injury. Uh, and the, the outcome measure was any change in the normal treatment plan uh, directed by the results of the CT. So whether or not the CT changed what they were planning to do if they didn't get the CT. They look at early hospital discharge. If patients that would be released from the emergency department were now admitted for observation, if they operated on somebody, or if they had to do additional diagnostic studies. So good, good, good thinking process. And they concluded that whole body CT resulted in a change of treatment in 19% of a thousand patients without obvious external signs of injuries. What's hard to determine what's the clinically, clinical relevance of those uh, changes in treatment for those 19%, but nonetheless, the plan changed 19%, so you gotta, you gotta know that. A similar study uh, published uh, a year later in Journal of Trauma uh, looked at uh, getting a CT of the chest and abdomen routinely in addition to conventional x-rays, the usual workup that we do in blunt trauma patients, and they concluded that scanning the chest and abdomen routinely in patients result in a change of treatment in 34%, and this is, uh, this is a European study. So again, now you have two studies that there are some changes in management or treatment based on the results of the CT. This one uh, asks the question whether or not this is justified. And this is a study from, from UCLA, Gil Criers, Criers Group. And basically, this is interesting because they concluded that selective imaging would have failed to identify injuries in many of their patients with blunt trauma. So if you compare mandatory CT, mandatory imaging versus selective imaging, they're saying if you use selective imaging, we would miss a lot. They were unable to quantify the effects of imaging on the final treatment plan, like the USC guys did, but they demonstrate that in light of a negative PAN-CT, the trauma service was willing to discharge a substantial number of patients from the emergency department. So, sort of confusing, right? So, yeah, I identify more injuries. I can send people right off the bat home if the CT is negative, but I got to scan a bunch of people to get to that result. So not very clear uh, what the right thing to do is. And then this study was published in the same year in Journal of Trauma, another European study that uh, look at whole body CT as the first line diagnostic tool. Forget about everything else, just put them through the scan, don't even think about it, get the result at the other end. And here they focus on time. And they said that if you, do, if you take this approach, uh, diagnostic to multiple injuries uh, might shorten the time interval from arrival in the emergency room until final diagnosis. And therefore, you can implement your management plan more quickly, uh, and they believe that that translates into better patient care. So you come in, don't think about it, go through the scanner, get the result in the other end, and come up with a plan faster and get them out of the ED, admit or home, and this and that. So this position may, may improve. Now, does that change outcomes? Nobody has shown up to this point that there is a change in outcome. You haven't seen a piece of data that talks about outcome. Then came this study published in a good journal in the Lancet 2009. This is a, a study done uh, in Germany based on the, trauma, the German trauma registry, which is a national trauma registry like we have NTDB here. Uh, and they look at whole body CT during trauma resuscitations. Although this is a retrospective study, it was published in Lancet because it's a multi-institutional study and quite frankly, uh, well done. And basically, they look at uh, 
three years worth of data, 4,600 patients. So this is the largest study in the literature uh, that looked at this issue. These were severely injured patients, ISS greater than 16, all blunt trauma, and the outcome measure here is, is really mortality uh, compared to expected mortality calculated by trees in, in risk. And they, con they concluded that if you integrate a whole body CT protocol into your early trauma care, increases the probability of survival in patients with polytrauma. Therefore, it's recommended as a standard diagnostic method during early resuscitation. So there are a number of issues with this uh, paper. I just want to highlight a few. So this is maybe hard for you to read, but just this variable, shock on scene, or blood pressure less than 90, is 24% in the whole body CT group versus 20% in no non-whole body CT group, and that's statistically significant. So 4% more patients had sh were in shock. So th they are really pushing the envelope here because you heard many people say the worst place for you to be in the hospital with a hypotensive patient is in the CT scanner. Now these people are putting them in the CT scanner. Go figure. This one is also interesting. This is injury severity score, and actually patients that underwent the whole body protocol were more severely injured than those that went uh, selective imaging, underwent selective imaging. And here it begs the question, well, is this natural bias introduced based on the nature of the study, or is this really true that the sicker you are, the faster we should take you to the CT scanner? And the bottom line is that when they look at 24-hour mortality, which is the line above the red box there, uh, there was a small difference in mortality higher in the non-whole body CT group, 12% versus 10%. However, when you look at overall mortality, uh, there was basically no difference. They conclude that there is a difference, but the data shows that there is no difference. So something happened here. But early mortality is probably affected based on their data. Overall mortality is not. So 2009, we don't know. 2012, uh, people still writing about it, but now focusing on outcomes. So this is a study that looking at mortality and surgical management of blunt trauma. And basically, these guys did a very complicated, complex analysis, statistical analysis with propensity scores and this and that. It doesn't matter. We don't need to understand this. All you need to know is that when you look at the data, the data supports the use of whole body CT because all those boxes are on the left side of the, of the line there of the odds ratio plot. So this study looking at uh, uh, effectiveness in decreasing mortality and affecting outcome is positive. Okay, so if that, that study was, is well done and it shows 2012 study, why, why are we here discussing it? What's the deal? Why don't we start doing it more liberally? Well, it turns out that you heard this morning that there is a huge increase in the number of CT scans done because the technology is readily available, it's faster, it's easy to get, Cost has dropped a little bit, not much, but you know it's available, so we get it. Problem is that with that availability comes the problems, and the problem is radiation exposure. So in this table, you have different types of studies, the relevant organs that are affected by the radiation, and the relevant organ dose in millisieverts. So if you take a, a X-ray of your teeth, you go to the dentist, the relevant organ is the brain, and this is the amount of radiation that you're exposed, very minimal. Now, if you get an ab abdominal CT in an adult, this is the dose, 10. Keep that number in mind. If you get a barium minima, it's 15. If you get a neonatal abdominal CT, so relevant for the pediatric population, the amount of radiation is 20, it's much, much higher than for the adults. If you get a mammography, it's three. Now, looking at these numbers and looking at this graph on the right side, here 
this graph <laughs> here is the age of exposure, age of the patient, versus the lifetime risk of death from cancer per median patients exposed to 10, which is what you get when you get one abdominal CT. And how many patients we get two, three, four, five CTs during their hospital stay? So red is colon cancer, blue is lung cancer. So you can see that if you're exposed at an early age, like in the pediatric population, like Todd just told us, the risk is huge. And if you, obviously, if you're exposed when you are in above 65 or so, obviously there is not enough years. There's not you don't have enough time to die of cancer induced by 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 radiation. But this is important because this harms people. And this is another way of looking at this. So here you have risk categories. So no risk is white, and then negligible, minimal, very low, low. You can see the bar on the right side, on the left side of the graph. And this is the number of equivalent number of chest x-rays. So if, if you look at, for instance, uh, abdominal CT, the lifetime additional risk of cancer is one in 2,000, which is equivalent to five, the risk if you had undergone 500 chest x-rays. I mean, we've got to think about this. We are exposing a lot of people to a lot of radiation with a significant risk. So I think that's why we don't do it more liberally or those that have resisted. So uh, this is a study from Dr. Rizzoli sitting here. And, and I, I, I love this study because when we were in the middle of all this confusion between 2006 and 2009, when the Lancet study came out and showed some uh, effect in, on mortality, they looked at this in, in, in Toronto and they concluded that the necessary CT scans should be avoided because of the radiation exposure, the risk, uh, the excess cancer risk uh, uh, exists, is real, although it's small, uh, and, and people should be concerned about it, particularly thyroid cancer and, and other types of cancer. So there are pros and cons. I'll tell you about cost. So if you get a PAN scan, it costs a lot of money. In my hospital, it costs more than a thousand bucks, but cost varies a lot between hospitals, between the type of equipment, if your equipment has been paid or not, etc. cetera. The, the pros that applying strict guidelines, um, you may uh, actually get into some cost savings because you are more focused, you make the diagnosis, you don't need to repeat tests, you don't need the 10 x-rays that also cost money, etc. So from a pure cost point of view, there might be uh, some cost savings. But despite the concern of rising costs associated with liberal scanning, uh, a cost analysis has yet to be performed. And this is written in the USC paper. This, this is from their paper. They said, however, any financial analysis should also take into account the costs, both health-related, legal, associated with missed or delayed diagnosis that can be minimized by routine use of CT. So the discussion goes beyond the cost itself, but also the cost savings and whether or not there are also hidden costs if you miss injuries, patients have complications, prolonged hospitalization, and uh, legal costs. All right, so finally, somebody said, okay, this is a mess. Let's look at the data and get the best papers, do a meta-analysis, and try to answer this question. Because quite frankly, would not be ethical to do a prospective randomized study. If you know somebody needs a CT and you don't do a CT, it's not fair. If you know somebody doesn't need a CT and you do a CT, it's also not fair. So that study, the right study will never be done. So this is the best, in my opinion, that we can, we can, we can do. And this is a meta-analysis of total body CT compared to uh, selective imaging. So just, when, uh, this is a busy slide, but I'll show you. They only found four studies that met all the criteria to do a decent meta-analysis, and all of them are done in Europe. And interestingly enough, that study that's the largest is study number one on the meta-analysis. So there might be some bias introducing this meta-analysis because one study 
is several times larger than the other studies. You can see the number of patients. But interestingly enough, so this is all blunt with the exception of one study that included penetrating uh, uh, patients. And only in two studies, they found a difference in age and in uh, ISS uh, compared the uh, total body and conventional imaging. But when they look at overall mortality, really there is no difference. So at least in this math analysis, putting together the best data that's out there, it appears that whole body CT does not have a significant impact, if any, on mortality as an outcome measure. So when they put this in a graph form, here is the odds ratio line, and it's right on top of the line. So it doesn't favor one or the other. It seems that whole body CT at least is not superior than selective imaging as far as mortality goes. So um, I don't know if this is uh, enough, but some people become very creative when looking at these things. And now, I don't know what's going on in France, but they came up with this VTEL criteria to determine the need for whole body scanning. So basically, they came up with a bunch of variables, physiologic variables, kinetic elements, anatomical injuries, resuscitation prior to admission, and predisposition. If you look at this, this is what the CDC tri trauma triage criteria is. So they are saying, well, the VTEL criteria that some VTEL guy decided to create is based on what we call major uh, trauma criteria for triage to trauma centers, right? So what basically what they're saying is, yeah, you can put this in a nice format, and if you're a major trauma victim, uh, maybe you should, uh, should undergo whole body CT. But uh, the, the, the conclusion of the study is that if you don't do whole body CT, you're going to miss a bunch of injuries in the region that you should be studying, body region, and also in other regions of the body that you never suspect there was an injury. So those are those hidden injuries that I mentioned to you, a adrenal hematoma, uh, broken something, and a transverse process fracture, things that are not clinically relevant if you scan everybody. So again, the more you look for, the more you find, what you do with it is the question. So I don't have a good answer if it's the right or wrong. I told you we are biased, we use it selective. Uh, we use ultrasound to screen most, if not all, blunt trauma patients that are hemodynamically stable. But if you're gonna embark on this, you need to be thoughtful about it. And again, just like the warfarin reversal protocol, just like any other protocol that you have in your hospital. You've got to put this into an algorithm. You've got to think it through. And you've got to try to minimize the effects of radiation exposure by selecting patients better. So how do we integrate pan scan into trauma protocols is really the question, who you should scan. So you've got to develop your internal criteria because putting everybody through the scan, it's probably not the right thing to do. One, because it's too costly. Two, because it exposed too many people unnecessarily to radiation in three because it doesn't affect outcome as I hope uh, I demonstrated to you. Then the question is, you have gotta go to radiology and discuss with your radiologists in your CT techs the protocols that they use because there are ways now that we can scan people without exposing them excessively to radiation by using more modern protocols. So you can decrease the amount of radiation, you can be more selective. So there are tricks that you can do manipulating your CT protocols to uh, avoid excessive radiation. So it has to be collaboratively, collaborative and has to be multidisciplinary. And, and then the question you need to answer is how CT will interact with other diagnostic tools. So can I avoid some CTs by doing ultrasound? Is, is, can CT uh, uh, allow me to make diagnosis, for instance, of vascular injuries so I don't need to do angiograms? And you, we heard the discussion by Marty Cross this morning about angios versus CTAs. So you've got to put this in the context of the whole patient and, and see what comes out of it. And obviously, as the technology evolves, I think we, we will see that uh, cost will, will decrease, uh, hopefully, and this won't be a burden to, to patients. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to you, but I think that at least I showed you the data. 
And I would encourage you, if this is your practice, that you study it and see if you can at least minimize those harmful effects by thinking it through and discussing with your radiologist changes in your protocols that will minimize radiation exposure. Thank you very much.